So if I'm being honest, this video kind of drifts on a bit. Drones on. Oh my god. <laughs> For some reason, I can't think straight. And so when I speak throughout the video, I'm droning on and trying to make thoughts with my words. And they're not coming out easily. And so I keep umming and uhing. And it does affect the tone and pace and mood of the video. Same with the intonation issues with my pitch um, or whatnot. But um, let me not speak too much. I do want to note, though, as far as this topic, basically, I don't necessarily think that, um, that, uh, well, I'm conflicted about it because I would be considered an AGP based on the, um, the, uh, theory. But, like, my question is, how can someone like Little Richard exist? How can someone like any androgynous person who has experienced bisexuality or heterosexuality and is male exist. What are the questions for trans male, for trans males? You know, female to male transsexuals. Wh are, where do they fit in this? They're hardly acknowledged. They're seen as innocuous. Whereas I am seen as completely malicious and just, you know, not, not worth having. <laughs> How am I supposed to fit with that? Mind you, I'm five foot eight and a half and, and 24 years old. I transitioned at 19. I would have transitioned sooner, honestly, if it, not, if it were not for certain social forces preventing me from that. Okay, there are a lot of things that defy the pure stereotype of an AGP within me. And so, like, I just have a lot of questions about this whole trope of AGP alongside the trope of HSTS. And when I, speak to, when I spoke to Rod Fleming about it, the YouTuber, he, um, he seems to think that HSTS people are genuine pseudo-women. And then AGPs are just these mask-wearing men who are narcissists and are just empty and destroying their lives. And that just hurts to hear. Sorry if, it, if I sound weak and stupid, but, like, like I'm going to tell you the truth. And if you can't process it as truth, then I guess I'm seen as masquerading and I don't know what to do about that. I also want to note that I make a reference to space-time in the video. And let me get this right. With space-time, with space and time as a continuum, basically it's, it is a, you know, a binary continuum of sorts. With t Time is basically the metric of how far things traverse space. Or, or the rate at which people think traverse space versus other traversals of space. Space itself is measured based on the amount of time that takes to traverse it. So that's where the duality of them come, of it comes from and i go into that as an example of a binary that is continuous because they basically regress into each other in the um in the video i'll also note that my voice was a bit dry during a lot of the video and so my voice kind of i don't know it sounds kind of um chalky so i do notice that what am i doing look my point is all right so ideologically there's this idea of there not being a capacity for female attracted ma males to be women. And I don't necessarily agree with that because it, for one, is based around the um, binary separation of male and female, even though they interact as categories and they um, basically interweave through intersexuality and through a common gender, g genetic pool and et cetera, et cetera. And like a, you know, a homology of the of the gonadal structures the you know clitoris and penis are basically the same thing um well hold on see i don't know y'all are gonna just build on this video and take it as like like oh she's getting mad or she's getting stupid or like whatever you have all the stereotypes ready and i don't know why i'm gonna battle it because you think what you want but like this is all truthful like, look up homologous structures of gonads. It's true. Okay. It all comes from the same source, and so it all is continuous. And we all have estrogen and testosterone in us, estrogens and androgens in us. And basically, we all develop into varying forms of masculine and feminine, although stratified by what our genitals develop into, because then we'll have a sort of stratification of the hormonal balance in our bodies as either... Um, you know, 
largely estrogenic or largely androgenic. That's how it works. If that's too scientific for an HSTS to say, I'm sorry. I guess I'm being a passive-aggressive AGP. Y'all have the same stereotypes to use over and over again. So I'm going to get a bit passionate for this part because I wasn't in the rest of the video. Well, I was, but it didn't carry. So I'll try now. You also seem to have, all of you, you have a sense that, like, I don't know, that, like, so-called AGPs don't have a right to feel things, almost. It's like, you know, if you want to tap into your feminine side, don't, because you're a man. You know, what is that? Or, like, oh, you're getting angry? You're narcissistic. You're an AGP. You know, it's just such blatant stereotyping. And honestly, it is akin to racial stereotypes. Anyway. Like, I get your concerns, okay? Men are scary. Yeah, I guess, you know, the, the males are larger than, than females, yeah. And they, um you know, have more musculature and all that stuff. And they are much more responsible for crimes and misdemeanors than than women are, okay? But um, it's not my fault how I was born, okay? And uh, I have to make deal, I have to make deals with that every day and whenever I can. So I have to just deal with it. Okay. Sorry. You know, if you can't understand that being trans is basically your body develops in a way that does not accord with how you relate to your body, then whatever. You don't understand what it means to be trans. And maybe I shouldn't have to have the, I shouldn't have to have the patience for you. Maybe I, I like to have patience for people. So I'd love for you to understand that, but like, there's not much I can do other than to say my case. And if you won't even give it the time or legitimacy to listen to because of the person it's coming from or the gender of the person's or the sex of the person's coming from, ha 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 ha, I guess I almost fumbled, you know, then I can't help you. I can't. But I can still speak and some will listen. And if you don't think this has caused extreme anguish for me and other so-called AGPs as far as their sexuality, you have totally ignored a lot of problems, okay? Because yes, it does, okay? Hell, I even came out as a gay male in, in 2013, you know, when I was 16 years old. And basically I tried after that for several months to ignore, suppress, erase, and um, cover up away the uh, any attraction to females that I had. <laughs> you know, I... I didn't maliciously or falsely come out as gay, though. I thought I was a gay male because I felt these weird feelings of having a, you know, an identity underneath that was, un that was, un that was um, covered by my, uh, you know, maleness, wasn't visible. You know, that's basically my femininity. Whatever of it is left, I suppose. You know, and, um, you know, I basically interpreted that and the occasional attraction to men that I had as being, and curiosity I had for LGBT culture and for androgyny, as being um, gay, being a gay male. And in the end, it turned out that I was largely attracted to women. And, um, and you know, stereotypically, as far as my aesthetic now, kind of makes sense that I, that that was the case. But yeah, um, it, uh, th if that's not ex enough evidence that, like, this goes on, early on in life, not just suddenly someone gets a kick out of it, you know, it's, it, it just, it, it's so hard to hear these things when they're spoken about implicitly about you, and then you're supposed to at least consider these opinions, you know, because yeah, there is a national debate right now, an international debate right now. A lot of people are learning about this stuff, and there's a whole revolution affiliated with it. Um, and they're radicals, and they're moderates. And, you know, I just want to have people on the same page. But, like, goodness, it's, it's a sensitive topic for those involved, namely. And, and I have to state my case. I'm trans. I'm female. I'm also male. But, like... You know, you you can imagine my distress. My distress. I'm a lesbian too. <laughs> That's always distressing. Oh yeah, I fumbled again.
Because no, lesbianism is beautiful. And if you were a lesbian, you'd understand that. Ha 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 ha. But lesbians struggle. So like, how do you, if you, if you don't understand that, then no, I'm just ranting now. All right. Anyway, let's just get over to the video. Okay. Huh. My voice cracked. I guess I'm a man. Well, at least I was passionate this time. I, um, I guess I'll have to simmer down a bit. Yes. I despise when my voice cracks because I associate it with a masculinized voice. Um, whatever. And yeah, I guess I am a bit autistic. I guess that's another stereotype of AGPs that fulfills your dogma. Just another Tim meltdown. You will never be a woman. If you're hearing the background, I'm not sure what it is. My, uh, one of my neighbors, um, well, you know, I'm 24 and a lot of people are moving out, you know, um, and, uh, I think that my neighbors across the street have moved out and something's happening with the roof and the entire house actually, um, here. I can see with this brightness plaguing this blankets all over the house. Anyway, the sun is so bright today. Wow. Not really used to this. It's been so cloudy and sometimes rainy um, in the past few weeks that kind of is unfamiliar actually. But yeah, the sun is bright and high right now. I like it. So I have work at noon and I have to make this quick as a result. Um, I guess I have some time. It is like, 9 30 right now so an hour or so an hour and a half if i want to get there on time I have time for myself um but i wanted to discuss a couple topics that have piqued my interest in recent weeks regarding um transsexualism and being transgender and they have to do with blanchard um ray blanchard's um typology regarding um, transgender identity and sexuality. But first, I do want to note that it has been a rough few days for me. Um, I've just been, um, you know, confronting certain things in my life and myself that, um, you know, often strike a nerve for me and try to make peace with them. Uh, I can't say too much right now because it's all kind of a mess, but I do want to uh, acknowledge that because um, that's what's on my mind, but for now. Today I want to talk about Blanchardianism and the concept of AGPs and HSTSs, which is in short for autogynophiles and heteros and homosexual transsexuals. I was brought to this concept by Shannon Riley Martin, a YouTuber on YouTube, who discussed in depth this concept or double concept um, with reference to um, some teachings by Rod Fleming also, um, who has, is also a YouTuber and has discussed um, a lot of Blanchardian typology and understanding of gender and sexuality. Now, Blanchardianism sprouts from the name Blanchard, which is the last name of Ray Blanchard, who um, was born in 1945 and in the 20th century published an understanding of, of transsexualism that basically defined pure transsexuals as homosexuals who seek to feminize their appearance into women and autogynophiles as as heterosexual men or non-homosexual men who have a paraphilia um, that um, involves imagining themselves as women and being aroused by the idea. Now, Shannon believes that both conditions, psychosexually motivated and essentially harmless and when kept in check um, 
are valid and fine to live out. But the implication of the condition often leads to the understanding that homosexual transsexuals have legitimate and sound innocent reasons to transition as they do, and that um, non-homosexual transgender people um, have malicious or disingenuous causes for their transitions. Anyway, as someone who has some sympathy for conservative ideas, I take interest in Blanchard's theory, but I also quite thoroughly disagree with it in many ways. That said, I don't think it's entirely unfounded, and indeed I'll go into that. What I do think that this theory gets correct is a lot to do actually with what I think it gets wrong, which basically comes down to binarized thinking about sex, gender, and sexuality. Since I became more enlightened about my own identity and about what sex can be and how sex phenotypes work, phenotypical sex, I should say. Since I learned more about sex years back, I have realized that sex is binary, but not purely. I think this is hard for people to understand because we think of binaries as purely binary, but it's often not so. Very commonly, a binary has spectrality. For instance, the spectrum from black to white, or even the color spectrum as a whole, which can be thought of as a binary between red and violet, but because of our cone receptors, it's not perceived that way. It's perceived as, um, at very least, three different colors, red, green, and blue, or it's perceived as an infinitum of colors. There's even the um, vocal concept of head and chest voice. Now we do have the TA muscles, thyroretinoid, and the CT muscles, cricothyroid, but they work in tandem to create different modes of vibration that can resemble varying mixes of chest voice and head voice, TA strength and CT flight. I, I often think of, of chest voice as fight and head voice as flight, and that's what I'm referring to when I say flight. For instance, between oh and ah, you can have and that, and you also have, ah, you know, and those are all mixtures of TA and CT functioning in tandem, you know, whereas the first two show extremes of what is the basic primary um, mixers, mixing conduits, you could think of them as their modules or whatnot. What you can concoct out of it is different modes of mixture of what they primarily do. Even to make another musical example, um, major and minor. We often think of this as a, um, a binary. Um, major being do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, ti, la, sol, la, mi, re, do. And minor being do, re, me, fa, sol, la, ta, do, ta, la, sol, but really, at the farther extremes of that, even you have basically hyper major, which is Lydian. Do re mi fa fi sol la ti do ti la sol fi mi re do. Just slightly brighter, and at the um, other spectrum you have Locrian, which is fully dissonant as opposed to fully consonant, which sounds like this. Hold on. Do, ra, me, fa, so, la, ta, do, ta, la, so, fa, me, ra, do. And right in the middle between these two, you have something that is perfectly symmetrical in its modality. It has, con it has um, aspects of major and minor, even though itself would be thought of as a minor mode because of the third, technically it still rings very bright for minor and very dark for major. Do, re, me, fa, so, la, la, ta, do, ta, la, so, fa, me, re, do. 
Va me re do, re do. Mm -hmm. What I mean is, even though you have the primary characteristics of do me and do me, and you have primary intervals that are, you know, either major intervals, do la do, and do la do minor, you know. You can mix those and create mixtures of, you know, masculine and feminine, major and minor, you know. And even space and time, which we often describe as a continuum, but we think of as fairly binary to each other, even unrelated. They interact because when you go really fast through space, time dilates. And when you, so theoretically, when you slow down time, also space regresses. Or something like that. I'm not a physicist. But basically, in terms of relativity, space and time also work on a continuous binary. It's not fully... Hello. They're not fully separate entities and their products are not fully spatial or temporal. But going back to sex, obviously the counterexample to the sex binary would be intersex people who are often semantically exploited for this um, sort of explanation of how sex is not a binary. Like I said, it is a binary, but it's not absolutely a binary. There is continuity, but it, the sides of male and female are stratified in such a way that we have the primary sex characteristics of the gonads, but also we have the um, secondary sex characteristics that can vary in terms of feminization and masculinization, and um, can even intermix. And in indeed, um, homosexuals and transsexuals are a prime example of that. And they're also an example of how we can't always ignore the, um, the niche, the, uh, you know, more anomalous seeming results, the ones that aren't so common, because even they have cause. I'll even get to that, into that in a second. So you know how things fall at a constant rate of acceleration? They don't. Um, <laughs> air resistance plays such a prime role in how an object falls. If I drop this paper, it drops very slowly, okay? Those are my notes, by the way. However, if I jump, I jump and fall pretty constantly at a rate of fairly fast compared to the papers. I was able to jump and fall about the same time that the papers took to the ground. The papers also fall in a way that is, that um, in which their shape is elastically, <laughs> I'm not gonna babble like I'm a scientist, but basically the papers don't keep their shape the whole way down and they morph a little bit and they fall and you know, all that stuff. We understand this, that Basically, when an object falls, it's always being interacted with by other forces. And indeed, everything is falling constantly because falling is basically approaching a gravitational point. That's all it is. And indeed, when something falls to the Earth, the gravity is not the same as it would be at the very ground. So if you fall from one foot, it might not seem that way, but from a thousand feet, you're slightly slowed down accelerationally. When you fall from 100,000 feet, your fall is gonna slow down, it's gonna be slowed at the start, then become faster in acceleration as it goes down. But at the same time, you're gonna slow down around 120 miles an hour or so because that's your terminal velocity. And to me, this is an example of exception proving the rule because it proves that forces have consequences all forces have consequences that are constant, but at the same time, when you mix them together, you get different results from the basic prototype. So in other words, queer sexuality and um, physiology and gender, all those things, they matter. Although yes, they're born out of the primary forces of masculinization and feminization, which happen from in utero through puberty and on as long as you have hormones running through your body. Those hormones, by the way, are also binary. We have estrogens and androgens. Progesterone and estrogen are feminizing hormones, and testosterone is a masculinizing hormone. 
there's no gray between, but there is gray that can be created through mixing them. Light and dark are just presence of and absence of. Red and blue are just low frequency and high frequency. You can't have just those alone. I, uh, I focused a lot on the binaries now, um, the binary aspect of the theory. And I think that the theory has a point in that homosexual transsexuals, as the theory types them, probably do have a more femi naturally feminine appearance because homosexuality heavily correlates with cross-sex sort of development. You know, like gay men, at least stereotypically, I don't have studies to back it up fully, but well, actually I kind of do because there have been brain scans done of gay men and gay women that sort of show an androgynousness in their, you know, psychology. And likewise, in their development physically, you know, this is kind of why some people feel that they can identify a gay man or a gay woman out in the street without them saying it. Because we often notice it through more androgynous characteristics. You know, a higher voice for a man or a thicker voice for a woman. You know, taller for a woman and more chiseled in appearance. You know, maybe a bit more, um, you know, aggressive in personality. And then a, for a man, you know, kind of daintier in personality and kind of shorter, maybe, maybe less facial and body hair, you know, etc., etc. These, even if someone is not homosexual in these instances, we often typify it as a sort of physiological queerness. And indeed, often they face discrimination as such. Maybe subtler, but still. Likewise, even reverence for the same reasons that, you know, homosexuals might be seen as, you know, free-spirited. Yeah, sure, I'm sort of making some of this up, but you can get what I'm saying. On that note, actually, the theory basically implies that, that straight men, or at least non-heterosexual men, non-homosexual men, can not be feminine like a woman can be which I kind of dispute, you know. A lot of my favorite figures in, you know, the music scene and the, uh, you know, music history, pop history, definitely um, counteract against that understanding. Call it anecdotal, but David Bowie could definitely rock a dress. And Prince was a dainty five foot two. And if we think of these people as just inexplicable, inexplicable exceptions to the rule well that's kind of a lazy justification they exist for some reason and they exist as they do for some reason you tell me funnily enough i was commenting on one of rod fleming's videos and he replied implying that um rupaul who yes is a drag queen rather than a trans woman being 6'4 i just said he was 6'4 he said that you know basically he wouldn't be sufficient as a so-called invert um invert meaning someone who well, it's kind of a now derogatory or obsolete term for someone who is androgynous basically who is who has cross-gender characteristics while being one sex rod also thinks that um all gay people have a sort of gender dysphoria about themselves. And I question that maybe there's some aspect of discomfort about who they are, but that's so vague. And also transition as has been proven by, you know, any gay men, for instance, in Iran who have been forced to transition rather than just live as themselves. Um, it's not always wanted. Once again, I think that that is just an example of where Blanchard falls short. He is essentially suggesting that to be homosexual is to deviate so far from maleness or femaleness that one bears an inner androgyny of some of some, that causes some sort of inner discontent that can lead to transsexualism, whether genetically or um, 
over time during one's life. The latter half of that statement, by the way, contradicts um, the expectation that HSTSs will transition at a very young age. They don't always. I do agree, however, with Shannon that the term trans woman is a Western convention. It did not always exist and um, only exists worldwide through globalization. Likewise, not all trans people transition for the same motives. And I guess one could argue that trans male psychology has differences from trans female psychology. Likewise for etiology behind them because the um, SRY gene is not present in a trans man and in a trans woman it generally is present. And that leads a lot, uh, that has a lot to do with how, that has everything to do with how, whether someone develops into a biological male or a biological female. That said, to me, I definitely subscribe a lot to the idea of transsexualism. Now this is a bit controversial. The idea of transsexualism and transgender is being connected to intersexuality. And I think androgyny and homosexuality and bisexuality and the continuums thereof, they are all interrelated with intersexuality and vice versa. People often back away from that idea because, you know, what intersexuals go through based on being deemed intersexuals based on their physiology is very different from what most people go through, what anyone else goes through. But it's still based on the premise that there's only male and this set of expectations for male, and then there's only female and there's exp this expectations for female. And it neglects any idea of spectrality between the two. And we have to recall that but prior to feminism and the gay rights movement, being female and male was not just a simple physiological thing, um, or even just a multifaceted physiological thing. It was also very psychological and very social and very binarized, at least in the West. It's just the past hundred years that sort of dissolved, especially in the past 10. In fact, I recall this story about like, what, Annie Lennox being barred off MTV or something, or some sort of program, just not having, you know, having it with her. Um, basically thinking that she's a man because she has a deep voice, is fairly tall, has cropped hair, and has a boldness about her. She's clearly a cis woman, but that was the premise back then. Like, if you, if you didn't fit one or the other, people were going to question. Now granted, transsexualism was not as well known back then. Someone like Caroline Cossey, for instance, could fly right under the radar for a bit. But, you know, and she's intersex, by the way, of course. But anyone who bared someone who bore some androgyny, it was confusing to people. They couldn't just understand that this is an androgynous woman or androgynous man, or even just an androgynous person who identifies within that that um, that range of expression. I'm certain the same thing happened with Boy George, more or less. You know, who is thought of as a gender bender as well. And I guess in that matrix of interconnectedness between, you know, androgyny, non heterosexual sexuality, and um, you know, transsexualism. I, and intersexuality, I see that there is grounds for putting together homosexuality with transsexualism. I think they are related, and oftentimes it's suggested that, like, they don't relate at all, which isn't true. But still, it's a general tendency that, you know, non-conforming people who are attracted to the same um, assigned sex that's a dog. Like, yeah, they're more likely to um, exhibit some sort of cross-gender identification than someone who is just, you know, pretty unassumingly male or female. The paradox in that, though, is that for me, for instance, 
Um, I am by and large a lesbian trans woman. I um, did not appear particularly feminine before I transitioned, which is kind of archetypal to the AGP sort of thing. However, I definitely grappled with a sort of desire to be feminine and oftentimes my femininity did show and um, I had fear around that. Um, I recall actually um, this kind of camp moment back in fourth grade where I actually strip danced um, at a birthday party. <laughs> it was only kids there but like I don't even know what I was thinking, but I did. And it wasn't like a masculine strip dance. It was definitely like a sort of like showgirl sort of thing. Well, at least there's no footage of it, so we don't have to be uncomfortable, right? There's also that time in fourth grade where I told a male student that I'm a male Vivica A. Fox, whatever that means. You know, I definitely, and I recall actually in middle school, I said casually to myself, I might be by, I might be by gender. And in middle school, I and in high school, I had, um, I expressed shame and discontent over being male. I never posted that post on Facebook, but I remember saying that I was going to write it down. Another one was that I was going to say that my name is Haley Williams. And like, I, there are these little latent sort of, and sometimes not so latent, examples of me. Like, oftentimes, yeah, femininity did feel like a sort of relief or sort of, um, well, sometimes it also felt like, you know, a sort of thing to be anxious about, but also it felt more pure to be feminine, so to speak, kind of if that makes sense, but yeah. Um, and, uh, I recall even there was this man who, uh, he still identifies as a man, so he um, was taunted by a lot of the classmates for being really feminine. He's actually like over six feet tall, well over six feet tall, and um, like RuPaul, right? And I, I always felt a bit curious about that. I never was one who was taunting him, although maybe I had some funny thought about him at one point, but um, he was very feminine, like very camp. Kind of like a Chris Colfer type, or like a Kurt Hummel type person, you know, like from Glee. He had that way about him, and he almost transitioned actually. But yeah, um, indeed, not unlike many lesbians, my femininity was kind of soft and subdued. It was still there. I was still, you know, if I were to be born female, I probably would find some ease. Although I'd be probably a bit of a, you know, seen as kind of the nerdy girl, you know. But like, those exist. You know, even if it the typology or the expectations as Shannon mentions, I wasn't particularly into sports as a child. Um, I found a bit of anxiety around, um, you know, male friends. Although I only hang out with female friends, even though I had some, because, you know, it was what, 2008 or whatnot, whenever it was. So like, that didn't really happen that much because there were norms preventing that. I'll also note that I'm 24 years old. I transitioned at 19, which based on the typology is very atypical for an AGP. I even know a trans lesbian who is younger than me, who is either still in high school or is going to college. Um, her name is Boone Williams and she, uh, she has a YouTube channel on here. So I haven't spoken to her in a while, but she is indeed a trans lesbian publicly so. Like, yes, we have more ease blending in as men than say, the so-called homosexual transsexuals who are, you know, become heterosexual women. Um, but that doesn't mean there's no femininity in us. That's a very binary way of thinking. Even straight guys have a feminine side. I've seen Stephen Colbert in drag. Okay, it happens. <laughs> Look up Stephen Colbert. And like, yeah, many uh, trans lesbians are more tomboyish, you know. Might be into gaming. I wasn't, by the way. You know, that does happen. But like, okay, be a bit facetious, of course. They're lesbians. And also, mind you, I'm five foot eight and a half and pretty dainty figured. 
you know, this would be pretty uncommon for an AGP based on the typology. And maybe even in reality, though it doesn't discount her identities, but it's just proof that this can happen. It's possible for a trans woman to be attracted to women. They might not be on the same ideology as homosexual men, but they are on the same ideology as androgynous men, and probably on the same ideology as lesbian women because it's not totally separate, you know? Like the way I see it, I'm both a feminized male, I have it in my notes, I'm both a feminized male and a masculinized trans feminine person, and thus perhaps a woman in the bi biosocial sense, you know? Like all three of those are things I am, you know? They don't have to be separate and, you know, um, mutually exclusive. And as far as autogynephilia, which I have in my notes here, it's arguable as a component of trans womanhood, namely non-heterosexual trans womanhood, but it's not the entire core facilitation of it. I've even argued even, I'd even argue that it's part of um, heterosexual trans womanhood. Um, fantasizing about what being penetrated or being, you know, um, a female lover to a man is, in my opinion, just as autogynephilic. It's just that you're not attracted to the woman. You're attracted to the idea of being a woman because that's who you are. And that still appears in, you know, a so-called HSTS's fantasies. I think it's somewhat sexist to presume that just because a trans, just because a trans woman is attracted to men, they would innately have more femininity than a non-heterosexual trans woman. Although yes, there is that general tendency and there's truth in that to expect it absolutely is false. And even if the binary does exist, which it does, I believe it exists, the, that these binaries exist, like I said, they're not absolute binaries. There's stratification involved, but they are continuous. The Blanchardian theory does not leave room for the occurrence of cross-sex gender identification as an isolated phenomenon, always deemed a casual, a causal result of pathological psychology or psychosexual motivation by something else. If sex is homologous, which it is, phalloclitoris and labia scrotum, the latter term isn't really used much, but gets the idea across. Um, nipples, vocalis muscle size, wide range of bodily developmental opportunities, then there is room for self-justified transsexualism. By self-justified, I mean transsexualism that doesn't need to have a motivation underlying it or a justification of, you know, being attracted to a certain gender for it to happen. It can happen, you know, self-evidently without justification. And yeah, even going back to music, vocalis muscle size, like um, in the vocal tract length, vocal mass, like there's a wide range of women's voices and wide range of man's voices, you know? You know, all that stuff. Sorry, that was my best B flat five. Whatever, I'm not a soprano. Ooh. Yes, great. Also, midway of the video, Shannon uses um, pictures of Nikki tutorials and MJ Rodriguez as examples of HSTS and the Wachowski, the Wachowski twins and Jennifer Finney Boylan as examples of AGP. I'm not sure if I agree with that. And it's like, these are all very beautiful women, but like, Nikki Tutorials is six foot three and has a fairly strong chin. And then Jennifer Finney Boylan is pretty subtle in her appearance, you know? Like, it's kind of an imperfect look. It's kind of based on these stereotypes of femininity, masculinity, and androgyny. And of course, someone like Caitlyn Jenner, for instance, who would be typed as an AGP based on the typology, you know, 
yes, she transitioned at 65, but she also transitioned in her 40s. Or not even 40s, it was in the mid-80s, she was born 1949, so in her 30s. Um, and even once winning the gold at uh, the decathlon, she, um, she's confided about this in the interview with Diane Sawyer. She had this moment of thinking like, what have I done, what have I created, you know? Yes, Shannon, it's true that like, a lot of HSCSs can't, or a lot of, you know, gender non-conforming gay men or whatnot, it's really confusing, the terminology, can't hide their femininity, but not everyone's like that. In fact, if it were the case that everyone were like that, then there'd be no fuss about, you know, men not being able to express their feminine side in society. There's fuss about that because it's possible for you to hide your gender expression. Caitlyn Jenner also confided to her first wife, Linda Thompson. Um, I think that was her first wife, or there's another girl named, woman named Christy something. Christy Crownover, yeah. She confided to all of her wives, actually, all three of her wives, when she was married to them, about being transgender. And like, to erase that, even though it's a constant in her history, because she's not attracted to men, is preposterous. Or at the very least, loaded. We shouldn't lie to the cis general population, but simplification's already been done. We have to show what we experience and see, and not just heed what cis people tell us we are. Both their perspectives and ours, both their perspectives and ours, are different and worth considering to get the truth in stereo. Oh, also, the typology hardly discusses female to male transsexualism. It sort of does, but it kind of leaves it as, you know, brushes past it. It's not like it's not important. And both of these videos, Shannon's and Rod's, um, hardly acknowledge it at all. Now, I'm not one to say that Abigail Schreer's book doesn't deserve publication or, you know, that she's unfounded in what she's saying. I think there is a concerning flood of female to male transsexuals that has occurred and that's why you see the rise in detransitioners who you know like that deserves to be talked about um and i do think that there is sort of you know auto homoeroticism as uh which is once again androcentric because homoeroticism can happen among women technically too but yeah um a sense that like you know a woman wants to experience a heterosexual woman wants to experience life as a gay man instead of a straight woman because they feel a sort of perfect power in that um i think there's truth to that theory but um once again i don't think it absolutely holds water and so i think it's faulty but yeah it's barely discussed any sort of f to m stuff is sort of thought of as you know mostly harmful to them rather than anyone else whereas an agp is thought of as malicious and like as for, from what i can tell autogynephilia is basically just feeling sexy about yourself in a feminine light and yes women experience that too not all women experience it that often but women do experience that like anyone who has experienced themselves in a sexual light and found themselves to be an attractive specimen has basically experienced autogynephilia or, or autoandrophilia. Like, of course, if I am, you know, male and a trans woman and attracted to women, of course, I'm going to be at some point a male with fantasies about being female and being with a woman. You know, might even have fantasies about being female and being with a man because being with a man like I said before, you know, in the context of sexuality, heterosexuality sort of defines the game, or predefines the game at least. And as a result, you feel more feminine if you're with a guy than with a, with a girl, unless you understand yourself as homosexual. It's very confusing, but like, cis sexuality or cis cisgenderedness or gender conformity tends to go along with heterosexuality. And it makes sense that that would happen. The 
that these fantasies would appear within a trans woman's brain, namely a lesbian trans woman's brain. It is no different from the, uh, the um, fantasies of being with a man um, that a, tra that a so-called HSTS would have in the sense that it's just fantasizing about you in your true form, so to speak, being with someone who embraces you as such. Who doesn't want that? You know, anyone who doesn't dream like that thought is probably missing out on something. Or could be perfectly content with their lives, I don't know. Oh yeah, here's another note. It's also worth noting that AGPs would face more pressure and default expectation to conform to cishet norms, while HSTSs would have already been, been relegated to the LGBT community without even transitioning, at least by the theory standards, and would not feel pre or expect the fear of expectations, and would not feel pressure at that point to try to be regular men. At the very least, they would not feel pressure to be regular men the same way that. Um, AGPs would, right? Because HSDSs archetypally cannot, but AGPs are regular men, unassumingly masculine men. The truth is, from my experience with myself and with people who, you know, are lesbian trans women, is that we just find it, you know, the path of least resistance for a while to mask the feminine side of us, as many straight men do even, um, and many gay men do as well, and we just sort of simmer in that until, you know, psychology necessitates that we transition. I think it's also worth noting that there are plenty of trans women, who, namely lesbian trans women, who look strikingly masculine before the transition, and post-transition look rather feminine and perhaps don't even re resemble who they were before they transitioned very much. It's mentioned in Rod's video that HSTSs in Asia, you know, they look feminine from the start. And yeah, um, there is a tendency for them to transition rather easily and there not to be as much um, masculinity for them to change from before they transition. At least if my history of watching YouTube videos of the topic explains that. But, um, yeah, with so-called AGPs, I'd say it's more drastic. It looks more drastic. There's a wider range of change. But I think that that evinces that um, testosterone can really mask you as a trans woman. And estrogen and testosterone, and blockage of testosterone can really reveal you afterward. It doesn't have to be that before you transition, you look just like a woman who is dressed like a man. Otherwise, people, a lot of people wouldn't transition. <laughs> you know, wouldn't be a need, right? But there is a need, you know, and oftentimes that's the only thing that keeps the woman alive in them you know, for the people of the world to see, for them to see in the mirror. That's why we transition, so yeah. I think I've already said a lot with this video of also changed an energy level. So I think I'm gonna close it now and we'll see what I can do as far as editing. But um, thanks. And I hope that Shannon and Rod see this video and that others see this video and have some thoughts because I think I think I made a fair amount of sense. <laughs> and, um, you know, my experiences don't lie. They're my experiences. Likewise, the science doesn't lie. But to see it as simple absolutes is to ignore how forces interact. So that's what I have to say. Wow, it's 11.10. I have to go to work. Like, share, comment, subscribe. My Instagram is at shyextroversion. Thanks.